in China Global Television Network. Hello and welcome to Global Business Europe, live from CGTN in London. I'm Jamie Owen. And I'm Juliet Mann. Our top stories. Could different vaccines for the first and second doses make them more effective? UK scientists explore combining jabs. Our other headlines, the oil giant Shell reports a slump in profits as the pandemic hits global demand for energy. Joe Biden charts a new path for U.S. foreign policy, halting Trump's plan to withdraw forces from Germany. And an Iranian diplomat is sentenced to 20 years in prison by a Belgian court for plotting to bomb a rally. What happens if you give someone two different vaccines for their first and second doses? British researchers hope to find out. A new study is about to get underway to see whether mixing vaccines is safe and effective. This as door-to-door -door testing continues in a bid to bring mutant strains of the virus under control. Nicole Johnston reports. In Maidstone in Kent, authorities are trying to hunt down the variant of COVID-19 first identified in South Africa. Good afternoon, I understand you've got a dog. We're doing um, the COVID testing for the new strain for Vi. Are you interested in taking them? Yes. Yes. Sure. How many are in the house? Overseas? From street to street and door to door, police, firefighters and volunteers are dropping off home testing kits. This is probably the worst crisis to hit the communities in the UK for many generations and almost exclusively the residents have been fantastic. They're eager to have the test done, they're eager to help and they're eager to find out how far it has spread. The reason to aggressively target this virus and try and hunt down the South African strain is to try and protect the UK's vaccine strategy. The fear is that the strain first identified in South Africa could end up being not only more contagious, but some of the vaccines won't work as effectively against it. Eight operations like this are taking place in neighbourhoods, including parts of London, Kent and Surrey. The aim is to get 10,000 test results in each district to find out how far the variant has spread. 11 cases of community transmission have so far been reported. <laughs> Sheila Bolt and her husband have received their first dose of the Pfizer vaccine and support the so-called surge testing that's underway. I think it's a very good thing and I think it's a shame that they can't do it everywhere throughout the country so that they can trace where this is spreading because obviously everyone's scared stiff they're going to get it, especially at our age. Meanwhile, the UK has launched a study looking into whether you can give a different vaccine for the first and second dose. The British government has already decided to delay the second jab for up to three months to vaccinate as many people as possible in the first round. And we're looking in this study to give first and second doses of different vaccines. Uh, so whether you, you might be primed with the Pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine and then boosted with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And we're looking to see if the immune response that generates is as good as the currently approved schedules. But for Tracy and her neighbours in Maidstone, there could be many more weeks or months of lockdown ahead and it's taking its toll. I think it's harder because January is a, a blue time anyway. Nobody had the Christmas with their family that they hoped that they would have. Um, there doesn't seem to be a light. The government says there is a light, vaccines. But here in Kent, it's a dim light indeed. Nicole Johnston, CGTN, Maidstone. Well, Dr. Julian Tang is consultant virologist at the Leicester Royal Infirmary and an honorary associate professor at the University of Leicester's Department of Respiratory Sciences. He says combining different vaccines on the first and second doses could have several benefits. In principle, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. The two vaccines have tolerable adverse effects. They have good immunogenicity. Uh, we've seen mixing and matching of other vaccines, like the pneumococcal vaccines, for example, and as long as they target the same protein antigen, uh, then you'll boost the immune response with the second dose. Uh, even though it's a different design, as long as the target's the same, 
and then you boost the response from the first dose, the first priming dose as such. So I think it shouldn't be a problem. Could this mean faster rollouts of vaccine programs around the world? If there's a shortage of one vaccine, perhaps another supplier can come to the rescue. Possibly. Uh, I think the interval between those two vaccines needs to be explored somewhat because the clinical trials are only for that one vaccine being given, you know, two times prime and then boost. Uh, so the intervals between the different uh, types of vaccines may need to be explored further. And also to make sure there's no kind of buildup of adverse or risk of adverse uh, side effects, for example. Um, but I think this is, this is surmountable. I don't think that would be a long-term issue. And I think they may work quite well, uh, especially given the number of uh, people that still haven't been vaccinated. We all know about vaccine hesitancy being reported around the world. The UK government has already delayed the second dose, um, something that the research has absolutely endorsed. But do you think that um, people might be concerned with what might be seen as a sort of jigsaw approach? Not really. So if you know about uh, vaccines and uh, a bit of immunology, you know that the first dose of the vaccine, just like we're going to get one shot of flu vaccine, for example, that will produce most of the immune response that you need against that pathogen. The second dose and even the third dose like for other viruses like hepatitis B tend to be boosters of the first dose. Uh, and they're also meant to capture anyone who's not responsive to the first dose, but may need an extra kind of antigen stimulus. to that's given by the second dose, by the follow-up booster dose. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think there'll be a major issue with this approach, and it may well help to spread the, va the vaccines across more of the populations around the world that haven't had a chance to be vaccinated. And could mixing and matching the vaccines uh, potentially be more helpful uh, in fighting these new variants? If you have like an original vaccine like the Pfizer or the AstraZeneca from uh, say now, which, is, which has been designed on the earlier Wuhan Chinese virus strain, for example, then you then boost it with the new version of the vaccine, the uh, South African adapted generation of vaccines, then you get some additional protection from that second booster, uh, which you don't get with the first prime dose as such. So I think ma mixing and matching those types of vaccines you know, is feasible and may well be required to give that additional protection uh, to those variants. Because don't forget, the second dose of that vaccine uh, course, if it's been adapted to the new variant, that second dose becomes effectively the first dose of vaccine for that new variant. So we need to see whether we need a further booster if that new variant stays around to boost that second dose vaccine's um, defensiveness, uh, defense against that new variant uh, with a third dose specifically for that new variant, uh, if that makes sense. The World Health Organization has been debating the current global situation on COVID-19 vaccines. The group's Europe director has been speaking on some of the big issues surrounding vaccine rollouts. Our correspondent Mia Alberti is in Budapest. Mia, um, tell us a little bit more about what Mr. Kruger has been saying. Well, he started by urging nations not to fall into vaccine nationalism, saying, for example, no one is safe until everyone is safe, which has become a sort of slogan by the WHO to condemn this uh, com uh, competitiveness. And uh, this uh, WHO Europe director uh, asked European countries to work together and that results would come faster if that happened. He also touched on the delays of vaccine deliveries, saying that he understands the frustration of some countries, but he said that uh, these nations have to recognize the enormous scale of this process. And so they asked, he asked them uh, to be patient and to be understandable, to be tolerant with others. Uh, he also touched on the new variants of the coronavirus that are starting to spread across the continent. He uh, warns that health systems in Europe could be stressed even more with these variants that are more transmissible and stronger. And he also said that the WHO is concerned about the effectiveness of the existing vaccines against these, these new variants. But uh, in the end, he said that uh, the cooperation is the most important part, as well as patience. He said that the governments cannot continue with what he calls confusing narratives, or else citizens will lose some confidence and trust in the vaccine process. So most important, patience, tolerance, and cooperation.
The less confusion, more cooperation. Mia Alberti, thank you very much. The consulting company McKinsey has agreed to pay $573 million to settle investigations into its role in helping boost opioid sales. The company helped fuel the opioid epidemic by providing marketing advice to drug makers. 80% of this money will beef up treatment programs and bolster police budgets strained by the expanding abuse of the addictive painkillers. Deutsche Bank has made its first profit in six years, driven by cost-cutting and a global trading boom. Germany's largest lender reported a $135 million net profit for 2020. The bank has been trying to focus its business on less risky ventures like retail banking and asset management. Unilever's share price has fallen to a nine-month low after the consumer goods company posted weaker-than-expected 2020 results. This comes as the firm sets out long-term plans to accelerate growth, which include focusing on China, India and the United States. Those markets currently make up around 35% of its total revenue. It will also focus on expanding product lines such as plant-based food. Qualcomm shares have fallen 8% after the company reported first quarter sales fell short of estimates. The semiconductor company is the world's biggest supplier of mobile phone chips with customers including Apple and other big tech giants. Net income doubled year on year to just under $2.5 billion. You're watching Global Business Europe. Still ahead, a former child soldier who became a Ugandan warlord is convicted by the International Criminal Court. Covering the world from four continents, a new horizon. Teams in Beijing, Washington, D.C., Nairobi, and London. Who connect, interact, and inquire to bring you the stories that matter to all. The Link, only on CGTN. Search CGTN Europe wherever you get your podcasts to subscribe to The Agenda Podcast. The Agenda with me, Stephen Cole, always gets to the heart of the story. Just subscribe today and listen now. Don't forget you can sign up to our daily newsletter. We bring you all the top business headlines straight to your inbox. So sign up for free at this address. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back to Global Business Europe. The Bank of England says the UK economy will shrink by 4% over the coming quarter, but predicts a rapid recovery over the course of the year. The pound jumped more than half a percent against the dollar after the central bank warned it would be at least six months before it considers cutting rates into negative territory. Well, Trevor Williams is a former chief economist at Lloyd's Commercial Banking. He joins us now. Hello there, Trevor. Short-term pain, right. the longer-term gain. What, what's going to make the difference later in the year to the economic outlook? It's the rollout of the vaccine. It's the end of the lockdown. It's the reduction in the mandated shutdown across various industries in the UK. So a beginning of a return to normality will see quite a surging growth in Q2, 3 and 4 enough to give us growth of, on average over the year, I think of at least uh, 5%, which is pretty much what the authorities have penciled in. So the bank, they're looking at prices, they're looking at jobs, but they're also looking at vaccines. Let's talk about interest rates on hold at historic loads in the UK. But what do central bankers across the rest of Europe really have left in their toolkits now, do you think? Well, they can still cut rates further into negative territory in Europe. Uh, they obviously in negative territory already. They're in negative territory in Japan. There's zero here effectively at 0.1 and there's zero in the US. The bank has said that should things take a turn for the worse within the next six months, they'll consider making uh, UK interest rates join the pack of negative rates around the world. It should also be said, by the way, that if you look at market expectations of base rate over the next few years, they are pricing in negative rates of 
minus 0.1%. So official interest rates are still 0.1, but the market is pricing in an expectation that it could fall to minus 0.1. So it might be time to stuff that cash under the mattress. Um, let's talk about what happens on the other side of the pandemic. I mean, what's the route out of this without making the mistakes that we saw after the financial crisis of 2008, where the stimulus was, it could be argued, levelled off too quickly? Well, I think one thing we will know for sure is that the Chancellor on the budget on the 3rd of March will keep policy expansionary. Um, I think that's pretty much... Uh, baked in the cake. There won't be a return to austerity. They've kept saying the same thing. They're going to keep the measures in place which protect jobs and employment at least until the end of April, in my opinion, and longer if the economy took, takes a relapse. So the answer to the question is that they're going to keep monetary policy loose and they're not going to tighten fiscal policy. They're not going to raise taxes until the economy looks as if it's on a sustainable basis. And then I think further ahead, they will need to think about how they're going to fund the deficit that we have. Trevor Williams, thank you very much for that insight. China says it's carrying out preliminary studies into joining the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. China's Commerce Ministry says it's communicating with members on related issues. The current grouping includes Japan, Australia and nine other economies in the Asia-Pacific region and represents about 13% of global economic output. The UK has made a formal request to join. China and the European Union say they're working towards implementing their new investment agreement. Hundreds of Chinese entrepreneurs and experts met online with commercial representatives from the EU on Thursday. Feng Ile reports. The China-EU Comprehensive Agreement on Investment is waiting to take effect as it undergoes a rigorous legal review. But companies and investors say they are eager to embrace opportunities in promising sectors under the new framework. Experts believe the long-awaited deal is unprecedented and opens the door wide for European access to China's market and vice versa. Um, most of it uh, um, uh, is uh, about uh, new opportunities in the manufacturing sector, uh, which represent the bulk of uh, European investment uh, to China. Uh, but uh, uh, it also entails uh, a lot of concessions uh, within the services industry, um, whether they be telecommunication services of, uh, or uh, maritime um, uh, services, banking, insurance. Unlike traditional bilateral investment treaties, the CAI addresses not just market access. It's also expected to help correct what the EU viewed as imbalances in the relationship, ensuring an equal footing. This includes rules on state-owned enterprises, as well as greater transparency when it comes to subsidies. They will feel more confident to invest in China, and perhaps they will consider to invest in China to develop new projects here. Uh, secondly, um, China made very important commitments uh, regarding sustainable development, labor law. Of course, this field is also um, a field of great opportunities and we will see a lot of investment related to uh, climate change, to energy transition. Experts say the agreement will see both sides benefit from each other's advantages, forming a more complete global value chain namely through Europe's advanced high-tech sectors and China's outstanding manufacturing capacity. With market access relaxed, I think it brings a certain competitive pressure to Chinese companies. This will force them to increase their investment in research and development, to find ways to retain talent and really improve the competitiveness of their products. So in fact, I think it's a good thing to have pressures to survive when it comes to market competition. Experts say there will also be more joint ventures to exploit the market together as China shows greater determination to promote higher level opening to the rest of the world. With the agreement in place, many Europeans at the meeting say more investment and more bilateral events are likely to bring the China and EU economies closer, increasing cooperation in other areas in the future. Feng Yilei, CGTN, Beijing.
Royal Dutch Shell says it may cut production after reporting a net loss of $21.7 billion. The slump has been blamed on falling demand for oil and gas products caused by the pandemic. Nawid Jabarkal has the story. Oil major Royal Dutch Shell swung to an annual loss of almost $22 billion last year. The effects of the coronavirus continue to weigh on energy demand. The Anglo-Dutch firm isn't alone, though, with rivals like BP and American heavyweights like ExxonMobil also posting similar losses recently. COVID-19 has hit the industry hard, with lockdowns forcing businesses to shut and people to stay indoors. But it isn't the only thing that's driving change. You look at what's happened with the twin pressures of uh, a society, a global society, thinking about oil and gas. Do we need it? How do we need it? Uh, and the coronavirus pandemic, you know, demand dropping off a cliff. Even before the pandemic, most oil majors were moving towards cleaner energy. Shell has an ambitious target to be net zero by 2050, not just for the sake of the environment, but because it makes business sense. They'll have to. Simple as that. Shareholder pressure is changing. Investment funds are changing in what they want to invest in. And we as consumers are changing. So if they don't, they will, as I said earlier, they'll be out of business. Alongside the annual loss, profits slumped more than 70% to around $5 billion. But Shell says it still plans to raise dividends for shareholders in the first quarter of this year. Bosses here are hoping demand for oil picks up when and if the coronavirus retreats. But essentially, it's the longer-term trend towards sustainability that's the bigger goal for Shell and for the survival of the industry. Norwegia Barkil, CGTN, London. A former Ugandan rebel commander has been convicted of war crimes and crimes against humanity at the International Criminal Court. Dominic Ongwen was abducted by the Lord's Resistance Army as a child and forced to become a soldier before rising through the ranks. It's the first case at the ICC to involve someone who's both a perpetrator and a victim. Dominic Ongwen has been found guilty beyond reasonable doubt of a number of of crimes committed in the context of the four specified attacks on the IDP camps of Pajule, Odek, Lukodi and Bok. Attacks against the civilian population, murder, attempted murder, torture, enslavement, outrages upon personal dignity, pillaging, destruction of property and persecution. Well, let's talk to our correspondent, Stefan de Vries in Amsterdam, who's been following this story for us. Stefan, not only did uh, Anguen order these atrocities to be carried out, but he personally committed crimes against women and children. Yes, he was found guilty of sex crimes against seven women whose names are mentioned in the judgment. He abducted them and they were forced into his household. He raped them, made them into their, his personal uh, sex slaves. Uh, they had to carry out works in his household. Um, so these were seven women. Then he did the same thing, also sex crimes with women and girls. His brigade, here also the judgment mentions uh, rape torture, sexual enslavement, and then lastly, he was found guilty of enrolling youngsters, forcing young boys into his army under 15 year olds uh, to take part in his fight. So these are very serious crimes against humanity, and the, the court in The Hague here in the Netherlands found Dominique Ongwen guilty on all 61 charges today. How hard was it for the court to convict him, given that in a sense he too was a victim, wasn't he? Yes, indeed, and that was the line of his defense. Uh, they said Dominic Ongwen was abducted when he was 10 or 14 years. The age is not really clear in the judgment. When he was abducted on his way to school and then forced to fight in the army. So he's, in a way, a victim. The judge uh, acknowledged the fact that he also suffered, but then he said that after his 18 years, he committed crime crimes uh, when he was fully aware of what he was doing. So he can be held accountable for his acts. That's also the judgment by the International Crime Court today. They didn't pronounce a sentence yet. That will have to come in the next couple of weeks. But Dominique Ongwen will face probably uh, a lifetime sentence, but that has been not uh, yet uh, declared today. Uh, that will come in the next couple of days. But a very serious uh, crimes against humanity and, of course, uh, also a relief for many of his alleged 4,000 uh, victims and their families. Stefan de Vries in Amsterdam, thank you very much. You're watching CGTN, still ahead. 
What will happen to Myanmar refugees camped on the Thai border now their country has returned to military rule? Patient after patient after patient. They take a long time to get better. They're the sickest patients we've ever seen. It's a race against time because we can all see uh, the threat that uh, our NHS faces, the pressure it's under. We're dealing with something we knew very little about. Europe's first two epicenters in February have received their first dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Another day, another grim milestone for the UK in its fight against COVID-19. 100,000 people have now lost their lives after contracting the virus. On the agenda with me, Stephen Cole, we look up into space. We look down into data. We look at debt. We look at politics. We look at opioids, climate change. We look at all the issues that really matter around the world. But you matter too. We want to tell the stories you want to see and hear about. Make it your agenda. We can try out the wild and crazy idea. Nothing can stop an idea whose time is coming. This idea is coming. I actually feel quite comfortable in isolation. We should all be very basic when we try to save the world. Oh, no. We hope it will happen. We have to live in hope. Hello, welcome back to Global Business Europe with Jamie Owen and Juliet Mann. Our top stories, UK scientists explore combining vaccines for the first and second doses. Oil giant Shell has reported a slump in profit, blamed on the pandemic's impact on global demand for energy. And President Biden has halted a plan to withdraw US forces from Germany, marking a new approach to security cooperation with Europe. At least 147 people associated with the government of Aung San Suu Kyi are known to be detained in Myanmar after Monday's military takeover. Dozens of MPs have defied the new military government by convening a symbolic meeting of parliament. They signed oaths of office at a government compound as a gesture of support for those arrested and to assert their opposition to the military action. Thousands of refugees from Myanmar living in camps on the border with Thailand face an uncertain future now that their country has returned to military rule. Thai authorities are promising to step up patrols in one of the largest camps. Martin Lowe reports. There are around 100,000 Myanmar refugees here in this area in a string of refugee camps right along this border uh, between Thailand and Myanmar. This is the largest camp at Mela. There are perhaps as many as 40,000 uh, Myanmar people living inside this compound surrounded by Thai soldiers and camp guards. Now, I've spoken to a number of them today. They're hugely concerned by what they've seen happening in their homeland. Uh, they, they're concerned to see that the army uh, are back in control after, after years where it looked as though a transition to a, a civilian government was progressing. Uh, many of the people here say that they would like at some point to be repatriated back to Myanmar, but they're frightened. They don't want to go back.
back until they're completely uh, satisfied that ethnic violence uh, and intimidation by uh, perhaps the security forces that they've seen in the past it is over. Now, it did seem very much that things were moving in that direction from 2011 onwards. There has been a transition uh, from military to civilian rule uh, and uh, uh, very much the talk has been about repatriation and closing these camps along this border. Uh, but this latest development seems to have put that on hold. Certainly people here uh, say that they, have, they would not want to go back to their country while it is in the midst of all this turmoil. Uh, and so certainly uh, here developments are being watched intensely uh, to see what the future will bring. Uh, but, but it does seem, uh, certainly to the people here, many of whom fled uh, from intimidation and conflict, uh, that until the situation is normalised, uh, they would have uh, absolutely no uh, confidence uh, in being repatriated back to Myanmar from these refugee camps. Martin Lowe on the Thai border with Myanmar. U.S. plans to withdraw 12,000 troops from Germany have been frozen pending a review of the move, which was authorized by the former President Donald Trump. President Joe Biden has been critical of Trump's treatment of European allies and has pledged a fresh start for transatlantic relations. Well, let's talk now to our correspondent, Ryan Thompson, who's been following the story for us. Ryan, not an unexpected move by the Biden administration. Uh, how will this impact transatlantic ties, which have been strained so much during President Trump's time? Hi, Jamie. Well, we expect this to boost ties. During the four years of Donald Trump's presidency, on many issues and sticking points, European leaders were able to be diplomatic and look away. But the pull on the NATO organization was quite strong because of the former U.S. presidents, in a lot of ways, bad-mouthing of it. Uh, the official line out of Washington is they are taking a very thorough review of the current U.S. troop presence uh, here in Germany. If you remember, it's 12,000 troops, and under the Trump plan, 6,000 were to return to the United States. Well, another 6,000 were to be rebased elsewhere in Europe. We expected uh, that to be Poland or another uh, Eastern European uh, country. We are really not expecting a withdrawal to come out of this, and that is very much music to Germany's ears. But it's also good news for the rest of Europe, including the NATO organization. We were listening to the Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg speaking earlier, where he acknowledged that the four years of Donald Trump's presidency were quite difficult for many of the European leaders, and including politically for the alliance. But this transition of power has been and smooth so far, and he believes it has a lot in store. These values, freedom, democracy, the rule of law, are not abstract notions. They are at the very core of who we are. And we got a shocking reminder of this as we watched the attack on the United States Congress just a month ago. That was not only an assault on the heart of American democracy, but also on the core values of NATO. President Biden's inauguration on those same steps just two weeks later showed the strength of democracy. Ryan, what's been the reaction in Germany to this review? Well, we've yet to hear anything specific about this from Berlin just yet, despite our inquiries. But if you remember just a little bit a while ago when the U.S. Congress placed some caps and controls on these troop movements during uh, the Trump administration's sort of last hurrah bill in December, uh, Berlin admitted and came out that they didn't have any information ever receiving, received ever information uh, from Washington about what this troop withdrawal would actually look like. Uh, this speaks dramatically to the relationship that Berlin had with the Trump administration at that time. But when this did happen in December, Heiko Maas, the German foreign minister, came out and said that he welcomed the news. He does not want uh, the American troops to leave Germany. And he basically opened the door to them, saying that they always have a place here. They are so important for European security. Ryan, previous U.S. administrations have been critical of uh, EU contributions uh, to uh, European defense budgets. Presumably, EU uh, countries will have to step up to the plate and start writing some bigger checks. 
Well, that was what drew, drove the divide between the Trump administration and NATO. Previous U.S. administrations had sort of given a pass to certain countries, but at this point, it's really only a handful of NATO members that are meeting that requirement for 2% of the GDP met. Now, will Joe Biden take as much of a firm stance on that as his predecessor? We don't expect it, but of course, Donald Trump was the one who took the bold position to really encourage members to do that and threaten uh, serious withdrawals if they didn't meet his, uh, his requirements on this. Ryan Thompson, thank you very much for talking to us. We may get more news on that in the next few hours when President Biden lays out his foreign policy priorities in a speech at the State Department. Among his first challenges will be the situation in Myanmar. Our correspondent Jim Spellman is in the United States. Um, Jim, the international community was pretty blindsided um, by the, the coup in Myanmar. Um, what, in terms of Myanmar, what are we expecting Biden to say in this speech? Well, Biden immediately condemned the military takeover, calling it, quote, a direct assault on the country's transition to democracy. Uh, Biden has already uh, thrown out the possibility of putting in place sanctions against Myanmar's military leaders. He's working with Republicans in Congress right now to put together a package on that. Meantime, the U.S. State Department is reviewing aid to Myanmar. It's about $108 million a year in aid. Most of it is humanitarian aid that flows through NGOs. The State Department says they won't touch that. There's no direct military assistance and a limited amount of aid to the government there, so it's unclear what, if any, impact cutting that small amount of aid would end up having. We do know that Biden will try to move forward, whatever he decides to do, in a multilateral fashion. So you've already seen the U.S. sign on to a G7 letter condemning uh, the military takeover there. And in recent days, Biden, when speaking with foreign leaders, has brought up the issue, including in conversations with the leaders of Australia and the ROK. We do hope to learn more about that and other foreign policy challenges when Biden speaks at the State Department in a couple of hours. Juliet? So let's talk about those other foreign policy challenges. We know that President Biden is a bit of a veteran when it comes to, to foreign affairs. What do you expect his priorities will be? Well, I, you know, I think the first thing he's going to do is try to change the tone of U.S. diplomacy around the world. And then we'll see uh, him and all of his lieutenants, the State Department, uh, at State Department, try to reestablish ties with U.S. allies. Then the biggest challenge clearly will be the U.S. relationship with China. Joe Biden has yet to speak with the Chinese President Xi Jinping. We know the U.S. will aim to work with China on some cooperative issues, things like climate change. But when it comes to stickier issues, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, it's just not clear how the Biden administration plans to move forward. So we'll all be watching closely for any clues to that. We know, of course, that Beijing has drawn a hard line saying they want to cooperate on some things, but they will not uh, stand for any interference in what they consider to be their internal affairs. Beyond China, of course, you have some of the same issues the Trump administration dealt with, the DPRK, uh, Iran, Russia. We expect to see a different tact from the Biden administration, but many of these same challenges remain, and they're not the kind of things that will be solved overnight. Juliet? So same challenges, different tone. Jim Spellman, thank you. An Iranian diplomat has been sentenced to 20 years in prison by a Belgian court for planning to bomb a meeting of an exiled opposition group in France. The Iranian government has condemned the sentencing, calling it a clear violation of international law. Ross Cullen has the story. Asadollah Assadi was found guilty of attempted terrorism over a foiled bomb plot to attack a rally north of the French capital in June 2018. Assadi was an Iranian diplomat based in Austria who brought the bomb in on a commercial flight from Tehran to Vienna. He then drove to Luxembourg where he dropped off the device which was known by the codename the PlayStation. He was arrested on his way back from that meeting by German police. Three other Iranians were sentenced for their role as accomplices with 15, 17 and 18 year long jail terms. Reporters and members of the public were not allowed into the court in the Belgian city of Antwerp, which was heavily guarded by police with armoured vehicles and helicopters flying overhead. It's a historic judgment. It clearly shows that the Iranian regime uses terrorism as a state policy. And as you see, they made it very clear that the regime's diplomat, Asadi, was directly involved in this uh, terror plot. So I think now it's time for European countries to make a decision. Inaction is not acceptable under any uh, pretext. 
Iran has repeatedly dismissed the charges and denied any involvement. It called the allegations a Western trap and a false flag stunt by the National Council for Resistance to Iran, which it considers a terrorist group. The intended target of the bombing was a 2018 meet meeting of the Mujahideen Echalq, or MEK, one of the biggest exile groups opposed to the supreme leader of Iran. The specific target, though, was a woman called Maryam Rajavi, uh, the leader of the diplomatic wing of the MEK. And also at this gathering, north of Paris, along with the thousands of Iranian exiles, were the then US President Donald Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, and also the former Speaker of the US House of Representatives, Newt Gingrich. The verdict comes at a sensitive time for relations between the West and Iran. The EU has imposed sanctions on some individuals for human rights violations, but it also is seeking closer business and diplomatic ties with Tehran. Also, the uh, new U.S. President Joe Biden, uh, he's considering whether to lift economic sanctions that were reimposed by his predecessor, Donald Trump. Those sanctions came in in 2018 when the United States pulled out of the 2015 historic nuclear deal with Iran. Ross Cullen, CGTN, Paris. It's more news from around the world. EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell is heading to Moscow amid a charged atmosphere surrounding the jailing of opposition leader Alexei Navalny. He'll meet Kremlin officials in the first visit by a top EU envoy since 2017. Tensions are high in Russia amid ongoing protests by Navalny's supporters. He was jailed on Tuesday for violating a suspended sentence. Teachers, rail staff and other public service workers have protested in several French cities after unions called for a day of action. They want better job security, pay and conditions. It's the second strike by French teachers after they walked out last month calling for more resources and pay. Canada has added the Proud Boys organization to its list of terrorist entities. It follows pressure from politicians to take a harder line against far-right extremism in the wake of the deadly riot at the United States Capitol last month. The Proud Boys was founded by a Canadian and has branches in Canada and the US. It describes itself as a Western chauvinist organization. The United Nations is pressuring Ethiopia's Prime Minister to allow humanitarian aid into the northern Tigray region. Reports suggest the situation is dire, with hundreds of thousands in need of urgent help. Federal troops put down an armed uprising in November. There are fears the crisis could spread across the rest of Ethiopia. The head of the Australian Open has insisted that the first tennis Grand Slam of the season will begin as scheduled on Monday. That's despite more than 500 players and coaches being forced to isolate after contact with a positive coronavirus case. Fred Tiley says players will be free to participate in warm-up events once negative test results are returned. Italy's Mount Etna has erupted for the third time this year. Europe's most active volcano on the island of Sicily last blew its top 20 years ago. The past two nights, it's put on a spectacular show with lava fountains firing into the air. Now, have you ever seen Irish folk music played on a Chinese flute? Student Jalen Chu fell in love with Irish music after seeing River Dance on TV and for the past year has been learning all about it at the University of Limerick in Ireland. Now, a film of him playing the Bucks of Oran Moor on a traditional Chinese halusi pipe has gone viral. Europe.cgtn.com to hear him in action. And remember, CGTN is available to watch for free on all the major digital platforms or smart TVs on the Internet, on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV. You can also find us on YouTube and Daily Motion, as well as CGTN.com and the CGTN app. You're watching CGTN still ahead with one year to the start of the Beijing Winter Olympics. We look at why skiing is snowballing in China. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock.
Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Agreement is signed, but what is the real deal now the UK has left the EU for trade, for business, for the city, for ordinary people? Make sense of Brexit with CGTN. Welcome back to Global Business Europe. In Australia, authorities say it's too late for some people living near Perth to leave home as a massive bushfire continues to threaten communities. Firefighters say another day of hot temperatures and high winds are creating dangerous conditions for emergency crews and residents. And all this taking place in the midst of a COVID-19 lockdown. Greg Navarro reports. At least 10,000 hectares of land have been destroyed so far in anything standing in the massive bushfire's way. A number of homes have been lost and the morning winds are predicted to turn from easterly to northwesterly. Weather conditions are extremely volatile. At least 71 homes destroyed. Firefighters expect that number to rise as they assess fire damaged areas. At least six firefighters have been injured and hundreds of people forced to flee. Many you know, just, just, you know, overwhelmed. When I, just, yeah, just, I don't know if we can go back and even get any stuff or, I don't know, it's just really worrying. To everyone in those affected areas, we simply say, as you know, to please listen to and heed the advice of the official warnings and authorities and, of course, as always, please look out for each other. Despite the widespread destruction, the fire isn't the only concern. We're fighting disasters on two fronts, the devastating bushfires and the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a situation the likes of which we have never seen before. People have been told to ignore the stay-at-home orders if they feel threatened. We already have the car all packed up and, yeah, we headed down here to be nice and safe. For some living in the fast-moving fire's path, leaving is no longer an option. People need to remain vigilant. We don't want people to become complacent. Firefighters expect the dangerous, windy conditions to continue to fuel the fire at least until the weekend when there's a chance of rain in the forecast. Greg Navarro, CGTN, Sydney. Children right across the world have been hit by school closures and lockdowns, isolating them from their friends and disrupting their education. But some science projects can be done at home, like the Compost Challenge set jointly by the British International Education Association and China's Sung Chingling Science Culture Centre. Louise Greenwood reports. Composting may not be the most glamorous of hobbies, but it's a powerful way to reduce waste. Over the last six months, the Compost Challenge has been giving hundreds of school children in China and the UK the chance to learn about science while helping the environment. It was set up so that uh, young people could, I suppose, realise and recognise how much organic waste they produced within their own household. Um, and then produce a method to recycle that organic waste into something that was far more useful, i.e. compost, which could then be used to grow plants, um, even if they're house plants. The students found that most of their household waste was organic. This usually ends up in landfills where it rots and releases methane, a greenhouse gas which is considered the second biggest contributor to global warming after carbon dioxide. Climate change is a topic we feel very strongly about and it's a very relevant and important topic for young generations like ourselves to realise and learn from the mistakes of our ancestors and to try and attempt to solve this problem. We should dedicate ourselves in, uh, to the development uh, of our uh, earth, even 
if it's small, but together we will support the entire um, planet. For the British pupils who've had months of school closures or online-only lessons, these practical activities also provide a well-deserved screen break. I think it's been really lovely to have conversations with our peers and classmates about our challenge and also just to work together on one communal goal during lockdown. It's been really nice to have like motivation and to really try and do something great in the world and carry on our like, work during the lockdown. The students plan on expanding their composting efforts to the communities around them. We want to help the community and do our part in the community to make it rolled out into schools with educating people in the area as well as helping to develop possibly a system of um, composting stations within school and potentially speaking to members of parliament in order to make this happen. Both the UK and China are working towards net zero emissions as part of the Paris Agreement. How governments can achieve this will be a main topic of discussion at COP26 in Scotland later this year. Reducing food waste is also one of the UN's sustainable development goals. So composting may have an important role to play, and young people will be the ones who do it. Louise Greenwood, CGTN, London. There's optimism in China over the growth of the winter sports industry, despite the COVID-19 pandemic. Beijing is preparing to host the 2022 Winter Olympics, which gets underway exactly a year from now. Nicole Ng reports. Five years ago, Beijing became the first city given the chance to host both summer and winter Olympic Games. Beijing! Part of the bid, a promise to draw 300 million Chinese people to winter sports. It's a promise that's seen the industry boom and the number of skier visits double in just five years, according to industry research. Wu Bin is the author of an annual white paper on the Chinese snow sports market. I'm a skier and a snowboarder. He says between 2014 and 2019, the number of resorts went up 60 percent. Alongside it, purchases of new facilities. Facility of the ski resorts uh, uh, like uh, slow guns, slow groomers and the magic carpet, uh, it's all increased uh, more than 150 percent. Some of this can be linked to China's growing middle class. 20 years ago, uh, nobody skiing in China, and there were only f a few ski resorts in China. Now, in Beijing area, we have 20 ski resorts. People have money to participate in this sport, uh, so the ski industry become uh, more and more popular. Tens of millions were flocking to the slopes each year. That was until 2020. Despite the promising figures, ski resorts like this one have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Across China, visitor numbers fell to around 50% last year as a result of lockdowns and restrictions. The industry says the pandemic may have caused over 8 billion yuan in economic losses. That's over 1.2 billion US dollars. It's also caused the Badaling ski resort to rethink its strategy and focus instead on visitor retention, a nationwide problem. Around three in every four people will be one-time visitors. Getting them to come back can be a challenge. Up to 80% of skiers in China are beginners. Uh, so the problem is high injury rate and crowded people, lack of services, lack of management. So. Most of the skier first beginners, they don't have good experience. Part of the resort solution, giving all visitors training to build their skills and confidence. One year out from the Winter Olympics, what's also building up is excitement from those on the slopes and from an industry hoping to get back on track in 2021. Nick Holton, CGTN. Looks lovely, doesn't it? China's Spring Festival is just around the corner and the New Year celebrations are getting underway around the country. CGTN Xu Mengqi has been spending a day with a family in Henan province in China to learn more about their traditional way of warming up for the chilly festival season. <laughs> Look! <laughs>
Hello, everyone. Welcome to Grandpa News Family. Today, I was invited here to experience what local traditions are like for the Little Chinese New Year in China's northern countryside. And obviously, this is an occasion for family gathering. As is the case with every traditional Chinese festival, food takes center stage. And in this part of China, wheat has precedence over rice. Ah, uh, this has a name? <laughs> Date flower, fun. <laughs> for Grandpa Yu's family, the Little New Year also means it's time to stock up on food for the Spring Festival. There is also another important family tradition on this day. Dear Kitchen God, you'll ascend the heaven today. Please be kind to us and say more pleasant words about our family. Well, finally, here's our grand dinner after a whole day's preparation. And now that Xiao Nian is here, the Chinese New Year is really just around the corner. New Year, yeah. 新年马上到了，您现在是什么感受？我想我孙子。就他们在外地没有回来是吧？因为疫情回不来。But despite the absence of his grandchildren, Papa New says he's still happy, as all of his family members are safe and sound after a difficult year, and that is something he hopes will continue into the new year. Shi Mengxi, CGTN, Danampo Village, Henan Province. The headlines again. UK scientists are exploring using different vaccines for the first and second doses, with some saying it could make them more effective. Ten and a half million people in the UK have now been given the first dose of a vaccine. Another 915 deaths have been reported in the last 24 hours, down by around 300 deaths from a day earlier. While there have been another 20,634 cases of COVID-19 reported. Our other headlines: Oil giant Shell has reported a net loss of $21.7 billion caused by falling global energy demand driven by the pandemic. The firm says it's now looking at cutting production. And one other headline for you: Joe Biden has signaled a shift in United States security relations with Europe, pausing a plan put forward by his predecessor Donald Trump to withdraw troops from Germany. The U.S. president will make a major foreign policy speech in the next few hours. Well, that's it for Global Business Europe. Thanks for watching. More on all of our stories at Europe.cgtn.com or search for CGTN in your app store. CGTN is available to watch for free on all the major digital platforms, on smart TV or via the internet on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Android TV. You can also find us on YouTube and Daily Motion as well, and of course CGTN.com and the CGTN app. Coming up next on CGTN, it's Africa Live. We'll see you again tomorrow, same time, same place. From all of the team in London, it's goodbye.